Amen. Be seated. Oh, wait, you have. Tonight, uh, we're kind of starting out a new study, and uh, we're going to be taking um, the next several weeks, uh, it'll be more, we'll, we'll go on into the month of May. I want to take the opportunity to, do, to begin a character study. One of the most interesting th- uh, things to do in scripture, uh, scripture is often to take a particular person from Scripture and just look at their life and look at the way God worked in their life and the results of God's work in their life and how they responded to that. And, uh, and so we're going to begin tonight by looking at the life of Joseph. And so let me invite you to take your Bibles, please, and open to uh, Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. We're going to look at the entire chapter tonight and, uh, and talk about um, the, the beginning of Joseph's life and the danger of a dysfunctional family. The danger of a dysfunctional family. When I was growing up, um, my mom uh, talked about the fact that uh, she can remember uh, when she was little, uh, where she lived was, uh, was a, a road where it was mainly family. It's not unusual uh, in Washington County to, to find someone who's living in a particular part of the county and, and their neighbors on either side or cousins and, and, and relations and that sort of thing. And this was a similar kind of deal on this road. Everybody along this road was related. And the particular farm, my grandfather was a dairy farmer, and the reason he was a dairy farmer was uh, his grandfather on his mom's side asked if he and his wife would be willing to come up to Louisville and basically take care of my uh, great-great-grandfather and his wife, and when they passed away, they would leave my grandfather the farm. He could have it. And uh, so they agreed to do that, so they, they moved to Louisville, Kentucky from Knoxville, Tennessee, and, and moved in with um, uh, my great-great-grandparents, Baker, and uh, took care of them in their last few years of life. And when they passed away, they went to the funeral. And when they got home from the funeral and opened the front door and walked in the front door, I'm not exaggerating, there was not a single stick of furniture in the house. That during the funeral, relatives that lived on either side, because Grandpa Baker had decided to hand down the farm to his grandson and not to closer related relatives, had left their kids at home during the funeral and had them go over to the house and clean it out. There was not a chair to sit in. There was not a bed to sleep in. There was not a single stick of furniture left in the house. And my grandfather got in the car and he drove down to a a local furniture store, and unlike furniture stores today where you have to wait six to eight weeks for it to come in off the the truck from somewhere else, they actually had furniture in the showroom they would sell you, and he bought a dining room set and a living room set and three bedroom sets to put in that house so they would have a place to sit down that night and a place to sleep. And my mom tells stories of remembering going over to uh, a friend's house down the road, and she would come home and she would talk about how pretty their dining room set was, and my grandmother, her mother would remark, well, it ought to be. It used to be in this house right here. What was interesting was after my grandfather died, my grandmother lived several years, uh, a couple decades longer uh, after he passed away. And when she got close to the end of her life, the entire family was contacted and we were asked to come uh, up to Louisville to her home. And this was the instruction that we were given. Everything in the house, according to my grandfather's will, was to be auctioned off at the death of my grandmother. And the decision had been among the, the three daughters that they would do that early to provide funds for her care. But nobody was inheriting anything directly. According to the will, everything had to be sold. If you wanted anything in the house, you had to purchase it if you were a grandchild And if you were not a grandchild, if you were a child, if you were one of the three daughters, you could have it, but it was removed from your portion of the inheritance. That's the way it worked. And so we toured the house, and we looked at everything, and Angela and I had not been married very long, and and, and, uh, I don't know, was Haley Haley been born by that point, Uh, and, and Hannah was soon on her way. 
so we didn't have a lot of money to spend. And, and what was really funny, the only thing we bought of my grandparents was their washing machine because it matched our dryer and our washer had just died. Uh, and so uh, we, that was the only thing we bought and brought home. But the reason that my grandfather did that was his declaration was, my kids will not do what my cousins did. And 70 years later, okay, the effect of that dysfunction had so affected his life that he was bound to determine that was not going to be something. He was going to break that cycle. He was not going to allow that to carry on in his family. Tonight, as we begin our study of the life of Joseph, we cannot begin our study of Joseph's life without first stopping to look at his family and look at how the family he was raised in affected Joseph and his life, and to some extent, to be amazed at what God ends up doing in his life despite the family that he grew up in. Because the family that he grew up in was so dysfunctional, it was almost amazing that the kid had anything normal about him. And so I want to start tonight by going back and, and taking a few minutes and kind of looking through uh, the life of his family and, and kind of helping us understand as we come to this point where we are first introduced to Joseph at the age of 17, that we understand a little bit about who he was. Now, Joseph's dad was Jacob, okay? Uh, Isaac's son, Esau's twin brother. And uh, Jacob had a very appropriate name, okay? Uh, Jacob's name meant literally chiseler or deceiver, okay? We have a lot of kids in our world today named Jacob. I don't think parents understand what they're naming their child when they name him Jacob because it means chiseler or deceiver. And to be quite honest, that fit him very, very well. Now, Jacob was the younger of a set of twins, Jacob and Esau, we say it in that order, but Esau was actually the one that was born first. He was the oldest. And it had been prophesied by God that Jacob was going to be the one that was going to receive the blessing, and he would also be the one that would continue the line of Abraham. And the reason was, was that essentially Esau despised his place as the firstborn child. He came in from hunting one day, and perhaps you remember the story. He was so hungry, and, and, and Jacob was a little more of a homebody, and, and, and Esau was the outdoorsman. And, and he comes home, and Jacob is, is standing there, and he is cooking a bowl of stew, all right? And, uh, and, and Esau comes in, and he is starving. And he says, hey, give me a bowl of, of stew, because I am starving to death, and uh, that smells great. I've been out all day. I've been hunting, haven't caught anything. Why don't you give me something to eat? And Jacob, being the deceiver and the chiseler, uh, decided that this was a good opportunity to get a one, a, a one up on Jacob. Now, I have to confess, I'm a little sympathetic towards Jacob because I have an older brother, and any chance you had to get ahead, you had to take advantage of us. But uh, uh, Jacob decided to, uh, to, to, to throw a prospect on, on Esau, and basically he said, well, I'll tell you what, give me your birthright, and I'll give you a bowl of stew. And Esau said, what? He said, give me your birthright. I'll give you bowls too. Give me the bigger blessing. Give me the double portion of the inheritance. If you're starving that much, I mean, after all, what's an inheritance going to do? What good is it going to do you if you're dead of starvation? If you want it that badly, then I want the double portion of the inheritance. Give it to me and I'll give you bowls too. And Esau says, well, what good is a birthright if I starve to death? Fine, you can have it. Just give me the stew. And Jacob does. And the Bible says that God judges Esau because he despised his birthright, that God had given him a blessing that he refused, that he treated lightly. In addition to that, Esau refuses to follow his mother and father's advice. He will not marry a, a, a girl from his family. Instead, he mingles with and he marries a, a couple of Canaanite women. And as a result of that, he's kind of threatening the, uh, the line of Abraham because he is introducing Canaanite women into the family. And so uh, as a result of that, God will not allow Esau to receive the blessing. He gives it to Jacob, but he doesn't give it to Jacob because Jacob's a man of good, upright, moral character. It's probably more like Esau was a little worse than Jacob was, okay? And so um, Jacob receives the, um, he receives the blessing and he, he leaves. And by the way, he got the blessing through deception. His mother helped him out. She covered him uh, in fur and, and made him go to his dad who was blind and his dad put the, prayed the blessing over Jacob. And when Esau showed up, there was nothing left to give him as a blessing. And so Jacob runs off and he hides because Esau is going to kill him. And he leaves and he goes off and he spends time in a, in a foreign land. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, 
But while he's away and, and he's coming back, God confronts him. And he gets into a wrestling match with God that lasts most of the evening. And as, uh, as the sun was coming up, uh, as uh, it, the, the angel that he's wrestling with lets him go, uh, Jacob basically begs for a, a kind of a promise. And so God changes his name and changes it from Jacob, chiseler, deceiver, to Israel, which means that God strives. And it was the fact that he had wrestled all night with God and that God was going to give him a blessing as a result of that. And so his name has changed, but he's still kind of the same disreputable character. At the beginning of chapter 37, we have a sense of what Jacob is like as a father. And I want to look at the first four verses here for just a minute and and make some comments on some, some ways that Jacob lived. We're told in chapter 37, verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. In other words, he was a tattletale. Now Israel, and here's the thing I want you to see. Now Israel, that's Jacob. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So here's Jacob, and he is creating in his own household strife and division because he was, to some extent, a disconnected father. He was passive in his leadership as a man in his home. He recognized the fact that there was strife. I mean, when you've got sons that come together and and all children have a tendency to fight and not get along, I can testify to that through personal experience in my own home growing up and my own home I live in now. But to be unable to speak peacefully to one another, the fact that there is a continuous contention that goes on between them, Jacob is aware that this strife is rising up in his home, but he never, ever does anything about it. There's no evidence that Jacob ever steps in. There's no evidence that Jacob ever tried to teach them what God would have them do and the character that God would expect of them. At no point does Jacob take a leadership role in raising his sons. He is passive. He is disconnected as a father. As a matter of fact, he is so bad that he's showing favoritism. When it talks about that these are the generation of Joseph, the, uh, of Jacob, the very first thing we're told is that Jacob shows favoritism. He doesn't seem to see, he does not seem to care that he is causing division in his own home. Now, to give you some kind of idea of what Jacob's home life is like at this point, Jacob is living off in the country of his ancestors. All right, He has fled from Esau, and, and he, he doesn't want to, um, to get killed by Esau. So he is living with Laban, uh, who is a, a distant relative. And he is, he's living there, and he goes there, and while he's there, he finds a wife. He's there, and he sees this woman, the daughter of his uncle Laban, Rachel. And he falls desperately in love with Rachel. And so he goes to Laban. And to be honest, Jacob almost kind of met his match in Laban because they're kind of cut from the same cloth. And he goes to Laban and and he tells Laban, listen, I'm in love with Rachel. And I tell you what I'll do. I'll work seven years for you if you'll let me marry her. Laban like, that's a deal. Free labor, done. So Jacob labors for seven years. Rachel must have been a knockout. Okay, because seven years of of working for his future father-in-law so that he can get her. But the the marriage day comes and and, and the bride has to wear this kind of heavy veil. He doesn't, can't see her face. And and the marriage ceremony takes place. And and when they come into their tent, their dwelling to, to come together and consummate the marriage, what he's discovered is that Laban's pulled a fast one on him. Because he didn't marry Rachel. He married her older sister, Leah her older and less attractive sister, apparently. Well, he's very upset by this, and he goes back to Laban, and he confronts Laban to ask him to demand, why did you do this? 
And Laban's response is, well, it's not right for the younger sister to get married before the older sister. That's demeaning and humiliating to the older sister. But I'll make you a deal. Laban should have been a used car salesman. Pardon me if you're a used car salesman. He said, let me make you a deal. If you'll work another seven years, I'll let you marry Rachel. And Jacob agrees. So I'm telling you, Rachel must have been something. Because he works 14 years to marry this girl. And, and, and the Bible says that the time passed as if nothing. So he was desperately in love with her. And so he marries Rachel. And, and so finally he's got these two wives. But there's a problem. Jacob's not in love with Leah. To some extent he despises Leah. Because she is a constant reminder of the trick that was pulled on him by his uncle slash father-in-law. And so God looks down upon Leah and has pity upon her, and he blesses her with children. And in very rapid succession, she gives birth to four sons. Meanwhile, Rachel, who is the delight of Jacob's eye, is barren, and she cannot have any children. And as you can well imagine, the one who is despised is the one that's been able to bless him with sons, not just children, but sons, and the one who is loved can't seem to produce a single child, and they're sisters. So let's just throw a little more fuel on the fire, shall we? And this enormous conflict erupts between the wives of Jacob. Rachel is so desperate to win Jacob's approval and to demonstrate the fact that she can carry out her wifely duties by producing a child, that she decides to send her servant, Bilhah, to become Jacob's concubine. Now, Jacob is stupid, okay? And I say that because he had enough problems with two women in his house, he took on a third. He takes on a third, and she produces him two sons, okay? So now he has six sons, four by Leah, two by Rachel's servant. But Leah doesn't want to be outdone, and so she sends her servant in Zilpah, and now he's got two wives and two concubines, and Zilpah bears him two more sons. So now he has eight sons, two wives, two concubines, and a truckload of Advil. I just added that last part. Now, it really begins to grow, and, and, and the animosity continues to develop, and, and there's a particular story we're told that Rachel wanted some fruit that one of Leah's sons has brought home because the idea is this fruit will help barren women be able to produce children. And she actually bargained for a night with Jacob in an effort to get the fruit. And they work out a bargain. Now, men, how would you like your two wives to be fighting over who's going to spend the night with you and you're, you're going to have to perform some kind of husbandly duty in an effort that she can get fruit. I mean, it was this crazy, and it was this dysfunctional. But sure enough, Leah agrees to the deal. She gives Rachel the fruit and goes in and spends time with Jacob and bears Jacob um, two more sons and another daughter. Rachel pleads with the Lord because she's now behind on the count, severely. She pleads with the Lord that God would please open her womb and allow her to give birth to a son so that she could win the true love of her husband, although she already has it. And God relents, and he opens Rachel's womb, and she bears a son, Joseph. And so let me give you the count. Eleven sons. Six by Leah, one by Rachel, two by the servant Bilhah, two by the servant Zilpah, and one daughter by Leah. So here is Joseph, who to some extent, is, or not to some extent, is the youngest of the sons, okay? He's the baby boy. We all know about babies in the family, don't we? All right. He's the baby boy, and he is the only son of the beloved wife. He's born to Jacob in Jacob's old age. And so Jacob just begins to lavish everything he has upon this one son to the exclusion of the other ten. Passivity, favoritism, dysfunction like nobody's business. 
and the problems continue to grow. Jacob finally decides, you know what, I need to go home. It's time for me to go back to my father. It's time for me to go back to his land. I'm leaving. And so he tells Laban that he's going to leave. And Laban doesn't want him to leave. And they get into this little grudge match where they're trying to out-trick one another. And to be honest, God blesses Jacob not because Jacob, again, is deserving, but simply because Jacob is, is the one of promise. He's the son of promise at this point. And, and so God blesses Jacob, and he actually out-tricks Laban. And he leaves to go home. And he's finally heading home. And as they are heading home, they stop by a particular town. And if you turn back a couple of chapters to chapter 34, a terrible thing happens. Chapter 34, verse 1, we're told this. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, who was the prince of the land, so this is the prince's son, saw her, he seized her, lay with her, and humiliated her. In other words, he rapes her. Jacob's sons, Leah's sons, who are Dinah's brothers, are absolutely furious by what the prince's son has done to their sister. Now, the interesting thing is Shechem falls in love with Dinah, and he pleads with Jacob to let him marry her, even though he's raped her. How's that for the start of a marriage? And um, the sons come, the, the brothers come, and, and they kind of work out a deal. They said, all right, here's the deal. Since you've already done this, we're going to let you marry her, but, but you've got to be Hebrews like us. In order to be Hebrews like us, the difference that separates us from you is circumcision. This is really why I'm glad it's only adults in here tonight, because this just gets weird all the way around. Is circumcision. So you've got to circumcise everybody in town. And if you'll circumcise everybody in town, then we'll agree to let you marry her. Well, Shechem is so desperate to marry Dinah, he agrees to it. And he orders that every man in town be circumcised. And Scripture tells us in chapter 34 that as they were recovering from the circumcision, which meant they weren't real handy with battle, the sons of Jacob attack the city and utterly destroy it. They slaughter every man. They take captive all of the spoils of the town and every woman and every child. They kidnap them and make them their servants. When they come to Jacob, the paragon of morality, and tell him what they have done, Jacob's only response, are you ready for this, is his reputation. He doesn't seem at all upset by what they've done. He doesn't seem at all upset that they have lied, they have murdered, they have kidnapped, they have subjected, they have stolen. None of that seems to be his issue. This is his issue, verse 30. Then Jacob says to Simeon and to Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. And they said to him, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Jacob cares not for the immorality and the dastardly acts of his sons. His only concern is his self and his skin. And it goes on. As they're traveling home, Rachel dies. She becomes pregnant again, and she's very excited about the fact that she's able to bear Jacob a second son. But we are told that she begins to have problems in the pregnancy. And if you look in chapter 35, uh, verses 21 and 22, we're told um, that Israel journeyed on and pinched his, pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And while Israel lived in that land, Reuben, oh, I'm sorry, woo, let me back up there. Um, Rachel dies, I'm sorry, it's back in verse 16. Rachel dies giving birth to her son Benjamin. And she actually names him uh, Ben-Oni, which means son of my trouble. And Jacob changes his name to Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. But before he can even get home, Rachel, his beloved wife, has passed away. And, and now he has two sons by her. As they're getting closer to the land, Reuben, okay, the son of uh, um, 
uh, Leah commits a really terrible act. And, and look in verse 20, 21 and 22. Israel journeyed on, and he pitched his, pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. And while Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And I want you to look at the last statement that it says in that verse. And Israel heard of it. And that's it. Uh, Bilhah is uh, Jacob's concubine from Rachel. It is the mother of two of his sons. Reuben, this is to some extent something of the of a nature of a stepmother, not necessarily because she wasn't a full wife, but she belonged to Jacob as his concubine. This woman has children that are Reuben's half brothers, and Reuben goes in and he commits incest with her. And when Jacob hears of it from the recording of Scripture, he does nothing. He doesn't confront him. He doesn't correct him. He doesn't say a word to him. He continues to remain passive. He continues to remain disconnected. As a matter of fact, the only mention of it that we can find is in Genesis chapter 49 when Jacob is laying on his deathbed and Reuben comes in to receive the blessing. Jacob at that point for the very first time that we have recorded in scripture says anything to Reuben at all about what he's done. And he refuses to give Reuben the blessing that he deserves as the firstborn child. Reuben deserved to receive the greater blessing because he was the firstborn son. Jacob refuses to give it to him because he humiliated Jacob by coming into Jacob's bed and taking Jacob's concubine. Okay? So Jacob has been a disconnected father all the way throughout his life. He has been passive in relation to his children. He has allowed sin, he has allowed jealousy, he has allowed strife. He has allowed deception to continue on and on and on. And at no point does he ever step up and take responsibility that he has as the father in the household to set things right and to teach his children how to live according to God's law. He doesn't do it. And this is the house that Joseph grows up in. Now, when you look at Joseph, we discovered pretty early on, he is a favored son. I served as a youth minister in Louisiana, and we had a family in our church. Uh, it was a second marriage for the husband, a first marriage for the wife. They were a good bit apart in age, not tremendously, but she, he was about 15 to 20 years older than she was. Uh, and because it was her first marriage, she really wanted a child. He had several grown children at this point. As a matter of fact, he had grandkids. Uh, I'm sorry, he didn't have grandkids, but his children were grown and married and gone. And when they got married, they had a son. And it was interesting to watch Russ with his son because Russ didn't act like this was his son. Russ acted like this was his grandson. And you and I both know grandmamas and granddaddies are a lot easier on kids than mamas and daddies are. And his son, great kid, really was. But when he was a child, he, he, he ran a little wild at times because dad would never step in and say anything to him. And I joked with Russ one day about, you know, the fact, how does it feel to be as old as you are and to have grown kids and have an eight-year-old in your house? And Russ, this was Russ's comment. I kid you not, I will never forget this as long as I lived. He said, well, you know, I keep waiting for my sons to, have, to give me grandkids, and since they won't, I just went out and had one of my own. Well, let me tell you something. Joseph, to some extent, is treated like a grandchild. Like the first grandchild. In our house, we call that the golden child. Because Jacob lavishes on this boy. He's the favored son. He is born in Jacob's old age. For many, many years, he is the only son of Rachel, the beloved wife. And so Jacob just lavishes on this kid. And we're told in verse 37, looking at those first few verses again, um, that being 17 years old, uh, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report to them about their father. He's a tattletale. And, and we're told in verse 3, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all, the other, all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Because Jacob keeps lavishing on this one son, all the other boys, all 11 boys at this point, hate him, 
Hate him with a vengeance. Hate him to the point they will not talk to him. It had to be one of those issues if dad's back was turned, they smacked him on the back of the head when they walked in and, and did anything mean they could do to him because they couldn't stand the fact that they could not get any aspect of their father's love like Joseph did. This code is kind of interesting. There's been a lot of discussion exactly what is a code of many colors. Some have said that it was indeed exactly like it's described. It had a lot of different colors on it because that was a, an expensive and difficult process to dye cloth. To have something with a lot of colors like you see in the picture back here in the background would have been a very expensive, very difficult thing to do. Other people have said that it was richly ornamented, that there was a, a lot of jewels and that sort of thing on it that would have been looked like the robe that would have belonged to royalty. Uh, one uh, particular uh, author has even said that it was a very long coat, that, that the, the word that's given here gives the idea of sleeves and feet, that it had long sleeves and it had it reached all the way down to your feet. Now, if you're working out in the desert and you're a shepherd and you're doing some of the other things that they would have done in that particular day and time, you could not do that wearing a bathrobe. Okay, uh, you just could not do it if your robe, your outer robe, hung all the way down to your feet, and, and the sleeves reached all the way down to your hands. It was too cumbersome. It was too hot. You would not have been able to do work most of the time when you were doing work outside. You wore a sleeveless tunic, and and that was kind of short, so that you have freedom to move, and it was cool uh, because you're working in a desert setting. So if Joseph indeed has been given a coat by his dad that goes from his wrist to his ankles, guess how much work, how many chores Jojo has to do? Probably not too many. And so we see dad continuing to pour out favors in Joseph's life. Often wasn't doing work that his brothers did. We'll see in just a few minutes that he rarely was out tending the flocks uh, and uh, he, he was kept home. We know that he acted spoiled. We've already said in verse 2 that he brought a bad report to his father. Um, we, we can use that term that uh, he was kind of a tattletale, uh, but some of this may well be uh, the fact that he may have been telling lies. Bad report is sometimes uh, a term that's used of someone who comes in and tells untrue tales. So if he had gone out to, to check on his brothers and his brothers were ragging on him, he may well have come home and lied about them, uh, which dad would have responded very strongly to and they would have gotten in trouble for it. So we know that at the very best, he was a tattletale. At the very worst, he was a spoiled liar. Uh, we also know that he's a dreamer. Look at verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? And they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Now we're told in verse 5, they hated him even more for his dreams, and we're told again in verse 8, they hated him even more for his dreams. Verse 9 says, then he dreamed another dream, and he told it to his brothers and said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. And they're like, oh, great. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But look at verse 11. But his father kept the saying in mind. So here we see Joseph coming in. He's sharing dreams of success. We see these, the, the brother's jealousy, the hatred kind of growing for him. The term here is the idea of an absolute unstoppable rage, okay? Their dislike for him is growing to the point of an unstoppable rage. Even his dad is angry about the things that he says, but notice what his dad does. Nothing. He's disconnected. He's passive. It's dysfunctional. So now we stop and we take a look at the brothers because it's now getting really interesting. Verse 12, it says, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flocks near Shechem. Do we remember what Shechem was? Shechem was where the daughter Dinah was raped. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, 
Here am I. And so he said to them, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now the reason dad is worried is because what the brothers did at Shechem in in killing the men and kidnapping all the women and children and collecting the spoils, he's concerned that any other folks that are in that area who probably would have been related to those that were killed or kidnapped might want to do evil to Jacob's sons. And so he wants to make sure they're behaving themselves. And dad, who apparently is rather obtuse when it comes to recognizing what's going on, he's seen the dissension, he's seen the jealousy, sends his son out alone to go visit the brothers who hate him. Okay, not the smartest move. Verse 15 says, And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? He said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me, please, where they're pasturing the flocks. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So they're just up the road here. And Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. And they saw him from afar, and he came, before, uh, and he came near to them, and they conspired against him to kill him. Okay, jo- Jacob's not worried about Joseph's safety. He's blind to the situation in his own family. And when Jacob is coming near them, they desire to literally murder their own brother. That's the plan. That's how just incessantly boiling this rage has become. And they said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what will become of his dreams. Had enough of his mouth. I've got a really good way to shut him up. Let's just kill him. Now, Reuben, who is not on his dad's good side because of what he's done, apparently has decided to try to come back into favor with his dad. Or maybe he really did was concerned about Joseph because Joseph was the baby and Reuben was the oldest. But Reuben kind of comes to his defense, and we, we find this in verse 21. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, just throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. And Reuben said this, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. Now, I don't know if Reuben is doing this because he just feels responsibility. I don't know if he's trying to make up for the sin of what he's committed with his father's concubine. But he has this plan, but he leaves before Joseph arrives. And so they come after him. When Joseph came to the brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. Now I want you to notice what the focus of their anger was on. What did they go after? They went after the coat. The symbol of dad's love that they could never have. The symbol of dad's disconnect for them and his focus only on that one boy. And they stripped it off of him and they throw him down in a a cistern. Now, we have no idea what Joseph does at this point. We are told later in chapter 42 that he is begging and pleading with them to take him up out of this cistern and they just ignore him. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 25 that they sat down to eat. Gosh, beating him up made me hungry. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And so Joseph, uh, sa- uh, Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. And the Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, what's really fascinating about this is that 20 shekels of silver would have been the price for a crippled slave. In other words, he wasn't worth very much to anybody. And that's what they sold him for. Basically, they said, we'll take whatever if you'll just take him off our hands. And they paid him, 20, paid him 20 shekels of silver. And when Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brother and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? But they took Joseph's robe, and they slaughtered a goat, and they dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether or not it's your son's robe. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. And Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. 
And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. The sons come home. They have killed a goat. They've dipped the, the, the robe in the, in the blood. And they came home and they said, Hey, Dad, we were heading back and look at what we found. And throw the robe down in front of him. And, and Jacob goes into mourning. And, and we have a sense that this is a perpetual mourning. Normal time that a parent would mourn for the loss of a child was a month. But apparently Jacob never came out of mourning for the entire time that he believed Joseph to be dead. And their deception succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. They were rid of Joseph. Dad thought he was dead. And finally, for them, the saga is over. And meanwhile, here's the 17-year-old boy who went from being the favored son of a wealthy um, herder who's now a slave, shackled up, heading off down the road to only God knows where, literally. When you look at the story of Joseph's family and his upbringing, what we're going to discover about his life is really quite fascinating because it's amazing his dedication and devotion, his willingness to forgive, and his graciousness that God is going to grow up in his life when you look at how absolutely broken and destroyed his family was. And so with that, starting with such kind of a rather depressing beginning to this story, let me give you three things that I want you to keep in mind as we finish up tonight. Uh, Number one is this, that passivity from a parent will destroy a family. Passivity from a parent being disconnected from the life of your children will utterly destroy your family. Stephen Covey in his books, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Families, shares these changes that have happened in the family in the last 30 years. Illegitimate birth rates have increased by more than 400%. The percentage of families that are headed by a single parent has more than tripled in the last 30 years. Divorce rates have more than doubled. Teen suicide has increased by almost 300%. SAT scores, I found this kind of interesting. This generation that we've had come up where parents have sought their own life and kids have been left to their own devices and we don't want to destroy the creativity of the kids because that's what makes them smarter. SAT scores have dropped overall by an average of 73 points. They've gotten dumber. The number one health problem of women today is domestic violence. Four million women are beaten each year by domestic partners. 25% of all teenagers will graduate high school with a sexually transmitted disease, one in four. There is a report released by the CDC last week that said that there were more new cases of STDs in the United States last year than there were college freshmen entering college. The average child spends seven hours a day watching television and five minutes or less with their dad. One of the greatest concerns we have in the country today is really not the economy. It's the breakdown of the family. And the problems that we see taking place across our country are happening Because we are losing a generation that believes in the commitment of a marriage and the importance of being a family. I've watched in my own family where we've had family members who've done extremely well financially. But I've watched their lives utterly disintegrate because every member of the family was pursuing their own interests, desires, and there was very little effort to spend time together because they had the means to do so. And I made the comment to Angela one day, 
and we were talking about it. And I said, you know, four kids are expensive. By the way, four kids are expensive. And with having extra, not extra, but having a lot of kids in the household, there's not always a lot of extra to go around. And so that's forced us to do more things at home and to be more creative about things we do. But one of the, the benefits I think that's happened as a result of it is we've been able to spend more time as a family. And I find us having a greater relationship within our family than other families in my extended family who have the means to do whatever they want. Because we're focusing on our time together Because to some extent, our financial situation requires that. And I don't want you to think you're not paying your pastor well. You're paying your pastor well. And I appreciate your generosity and the way that you provide for all of the staff. I don't want you to think you're not. That's not my point. My point is, by not having tons of extra, we spend time together and we found ourselves having better quality of life, more so than lifestyle. And that lifestyle and quality of life are not the same thing. And if we don't, as the church of Jesus Christ, start focusing and instructing and encouraging families to grow stronger and to be stronger, we're going to continue to see the slide that we're seeing in society. Because the family was created by God as the foundation and the building block of society. We need men who will be men in their home, who will be the leaders of their home, who children will see love their wives, who children will see love them equally. You love every child different because they're all different, but you love them all equally. We need men to be connected and participating. We need Moms to be connected and participating. Passive, disconnected parents will destroy a family. And when we let the family be destroyed, society is destroyed. Point number two. Jealousy can rule your life. Jealousy can rule your life. Solomon says in in, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, that jealousy is as unyielding as the grave. Jealousy in this family was bred by the parents and the grandparents. And you can look in families today and see jealousy bred among children by the actions of parents and grandparents. And when that happens, when it's left unchecked, it can utterly rule and destroy your life. As we walk through Joseph's life, and we're going to see as he comes back together with the brothers near the end of his life, how their jealousy and their actions that came about as a result of their jealousy has literally overshadowed and affected their entire adult life because of a dad who was disconnected and poured his love on one and to some extent ignored the others. Jealousy can rule your life. And the most dangerous thing you can do is let it remain unchecked. And if jealousy is something that you're struggling with, you need to give that over to the Lord. And you need to ask the Lord to release you from that because it will rule and ruin your life. Truth number three, a positive point. Positive point is this, God can change anyone's life and God can use anyone's life to accomplish his will. Jacob was a chiseler and a deceiver till the very end. And yet he was the chosen one of God to carry on the legacy of Abraham and Isaac. And when you see it quoted in the Bible, what is it? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Because regardless of where you are in life and regardless of who you are in life, God can still use you. One of the most amazing things about the story of Joseph is that Joseph is arrogant and spoiled when we find him in chapter 37. 
But we're going to see God do a work in his life that's going to make him one of the most amazing, gracious, forgiving, strong leaders that you'll find in Scripture. God can use anyone to accomplish his will. And God can change anyone who's willing to give their heart and life fully unto him to be used according to his will. We are never too far to be out of God's reach. And we are never too late to be used by God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight for our time together and for this word. And I just pray that you would continue to lead us and teach us as we study the life of Joseph. Father, we know many people who are living lives in dysfunctional families. We know many people who are struggling in their home situations. And we may have family members of our own that are in extremely dysfunctional situations. But Father, we thank you that nothing is ever impossible for you and nothing is ever outside of your control and that even in the midst of dysfunction, that God, you can work in that situation and bring about blessing. And so Father, let us as moms and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles, be connected and engaging and loving one another in your name. Father, please do not allow jealousy to rule over our hearts, but instead let us give that over to you so that our lives are free to serve you. And Father, let our lives be continually offered to your will and your plan to be used according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks.